So welcome to my talk. I'm going to be talking today about SPMD programming in C++. Basically, a way to write SIMD code in C++ that's going to be uh, easy and fun. Uh, so just a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Nicholas. Um, I mostly work in video games technology. Uh, in the past, I've worked at some game studios like InLight Entertainment and EA Sports. Um, I've also worked at Intel doing graphics. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm working in a computer graphics research lab at the University of Victoria. Um, by the way, that's me. Uh, that's my girlfriend, Jessica. And these are our two cats. So uh, here's the overview for today's talk. Uh, first, I'm going to talk to you about just uh, basic SIMD building blocks, so just uh, the basic fundamentals of how to write code using SIMD. Uh, after that, I'm going to give you an uh, introduction to what SPMD is. And uh, in order to get you comfortable with the idea of SPMD, we're going to look at some case studies of where SPMD is used in the wild and be able to understand it at a, at a deeper level. Um, finally, I'm going to show you how to do SPMD programming in C++ using a small library I've made called cbpsbmd. So uh, without further ado, let's begin. So um, for SIMD building blocks, uh, I'm going to basically show you how to write uh, some basic SIMD code using intrinsics, which I'll explain in a second. So uh, the big idea of SIMD is, uh, if you're not aware, it stands for single instruction, multiple data, uh, which means that in one instruction, you do an, op you know, you do an operation on multiple operands you know, in parallel. So for example, if you have uh, these four floats, and you want to add them in parallel with four other floats, um, you can do that in one operation. And so um, in one SIMD instruction, you can do an addition in parallel that gives you the result of four floats uh, in parallel like that. So if you have to translate this to actual, you know, today C++ code, uh, you could do it like this. So um, can I kind of ease you into this notation here? Um, these statements uh, initialize the inputs that you can see at the top of the slide. Uh, so you can see on the left there, there's a kind of a new type maybe. Uh, this is M128. So the idea is that it's a 128-bit data type. Uh, that's a non-standard type. Um, the reason why it's 128 bits is because in 128 bits, you can store four 32-bit objects. So this is you store four floats. And uh, you can initialize these, var these variables in a, in a variety of ways. But um, right now, I'm just using uh, mmsetps. And this is an intrinsic function that lets you uh, initialize one of these M128s with four specific values. Um, which basically it'll translate to something like a, a, a move or a load. Um, so that's how you initialize these values. And, and by the way, um, I should mention the MM at the start, that's just a namespace for all these intrinsics for the finite instruction sets. And the uh, PS, is, it stands for packed single precision float. So the word packed is to emphasize the fact that there's more than one object being put into the same object, right? And uh, the S for single precision is just to say that it's 32 bit floats. So that's how you decode uh, basically these, these, these intrinsic names. Um, to do the addition, it's actually pretty straightforward. So mm add ps to just add uh, two pack single precision float registers. And that's how you get the result uh, that you can see on the top of the slide. Moving on, uh, you know, that's how you uh, do an operation on four objects, but uh, on four floats. But what if you want to do it on an array of floats? So the way you do that is basically uh, you just iterate over the array of floats in steps of SIMD width. So you might start here, do a parallel uh, addition here. Uh, move on to the next one in a step of four. Do another one. Move in a step of four. Do another one. All right, that's how you get uh, an addition using SIMD on an array of elements. If we have to write this in C++ code, we could do something like this. So for simplicity, we'll assume that the n is a, a let's say, a multiple of four, just so we don't have any weird trailing uh, objects. Um, and the for loop should be pretty familiar. It's just the same old for loop, but incrementing it in steps of four. So at every loop, we load the operands uh, that are going to be inputted. So here, let's just use the load PS intrinsic, which just gets, takes an address to memory and loads the four floats there. Um, so we've got two arrays, input one, input two. Um, that perform the addition, just the same way as the last slide. And finally, uh, store back the results to memory uh, using the store PS instruction, uh, which will, or sorry, intrinsic, which we will write it uh, to the output array. So it's as simple as that. Now. Um, that was how to implement the loop. And when it's all trivially parallel, like it's just a loop, everything's pretty easy. But um, what if you have an if else? Then it gets kind of weird because uh, it's not as obvious how to actually turn this into CMD code. So I'm going to show you how to do that. And I'm going to show you how to do it step by step. And uh, so the way it's going to work is that there's going to be basically two uh, things moving in here, two moving pieces. Uh, there's going to be a mask, which tells you which of the current computations are active. And uh, the A here is, is the input. And the reason why this four number is under A is because um, if we convert this function into a SIMD version of that function, it's going to be working on four inputs in parallel and giving you four results. And uh, 
So basically what I want you to think about this, the way I want you to think about this is, is think about it as if we're running this function four times in parallel, like if it was running on four threads in parallel. Um, and each of those threads of execution are gonna be represented by one column in the images I'm gonna show. And uh, to explain more the, the mask thing, it, it means that uh, those lanes are active, and you'll see what that means in a second. Um, and just to explain that the not zero is to say that it's, it's like all ones, like all fully high, uh, to say that's active. So the way they implement this in SIMD is um, when you get to a conditional statement like this if here, uh, what you do is you evaluate the expression a less than zero. But in, since if we convert this to SIMD, the value of a is actually four values. And so the result of the comparison is different depending on the value. So uh, you can see on the left there, uh, I've only turned on the, the elements of the mask where the comparison returned true. And the ones that are blue are the ones where the comparison failed. And I kind of like color coded on the right as well. And so the way it works is that when you do the statement inside the if block where you assign zero to A for example, um, that assignment only happens on the lanes of execution that are currently active. So you can see on the right there uh, for A, uh, the elements that were in blue which are not active, those ones didn't get affected by the assignment of zero. Only the ones that are active got, us, got assigned to zero. When we get to the else, you can just flip the mask. That's when we were doing it. And now the ones that were off are on and the ones that are on are off. And when we do A plus equals one, that addition of one only affects the lanes of execution where uh, the mask was active in the else block. So finally, you return the result. And what do you know? We get the result of basically this function being run four times uh, in parallel using SIMD. So I'm gonna translate the same function again, but this time using uh, intrinsics. And if, if you know intrinsics well, you'll, you'll see that uh, I'm kind of like cheating here. There's like some shortcuts of, of notation that don't actually work. Uh, so uh, this is basically just to fit it on a slide, so you'll have to excuse me for that. So going over the same process again, we start with a mask that's all on initially, and the inputs for A. Um, at the first step, we do a comparison. So this is the compare less than just doing a less than comparison. And the result of the comparison is actually exactly what is shown in the mask value. Um, so then in the next statement, uh, the, I'm using this blend V intrinsic. What blend V does is it takes two values and it merges them based on the values in a mask. So the value of mask decides whether the, the result should be taken from, the, from A or from zero. And so that's how uh, the, two, the two values, A and zero, are merged into one value based on the results of the comparison. Now you get to the else block, so you just flip the mask uh, using this imaginary not intrinsic, which uh, doesn't exist, but is convenient, and it's nice if it did exist. Um, and then when we get to the, to the blend V uh, for the else block, it's basically the same thing where uh, we're merging the values of A and A plus one based on the result of the mask. So only the, the lanes that are active in the else block get plus one, and the ones that didn't don't change. And there you go, we get the final result. So that's pretty much how you would actually implement this using intrinsics. And, and match, it matches pretty closely what the assembly code would look like. So um, if else is pretty basic, so what about all the other control flow that you get in a regular C program? Uh, like for a while or switch or continue? Um, you know, those are all possible. Um, and I think that what I've covered so far is enough for you to understand how to implement them. So I'm leaving it as an exercise for the reader. And just as a hint, it's just masks. Like everything's just masks, like everywhere. So uh, that's basically uh, the TLDR of how I implement all these other things. Now, um, this, I've shown you so far how to write uh, CMD code using assembly intrinsics, um, but it's not always the best choice for the job. So let's, let's see some pros and cons. Um, it's nice that the intrinsics are actually pretty close to assembly, so in that way you can kind of like maybe do some op, you know, assembly level optimizations of your code. But the problem is that uh, it's so ugly to implement stuff like if else and for loops and stuff that actually it's, it's hard to actually make your algorithm better. And it turns out that a lot of time that actually has a, a better payoff than, than futzing around with little like changes of assembly code. Um, also pretty annoying is the code's not really portable. Um, it's, it's bound to like a particular, well, the ones that I showed are bound to basically like x86. Uh, but even like if you, if you wrote like a certain intrinsics, like certain intrinsics only work on certain x86 processors. So it's not even portable like across x86. Um, and on top of that, so if you, if you run into this problem in production and you want to port to like ARM or something, uh, you'll have to write your code again. And so not only are you going to have duplicated code, but actually you're going to have like complicated duplicated code because this, like, this is like assembly-ish code and it's, it's not very easy to read or write and it's, there's lots of tr tricky details, so it's not easy to duplicate this code and actually do it properly. 
So, how can we fix these problems? Well, the solution I'm here to talk to you about today is uh, SPMD on SIMD. So, um, lots of acronyms here. So, let me explain. So, SPMD stands for Single Program Multiple Data. Uh, what it means is that you write a program as if it was just a regular old serial program. But in reality, the serial code you're running actually corresponds to doing SIMD work. So, we're gonna go more into, this, more into the detail about this, so don't worry if it doesn't make sense right away. Um, one of the things that's really nice about it, that you'll learn to appreciate, hopefully, is that uh, with this design, you get what they call maximal convergence. And what maximal convergence means is that, um, let, let's put it this way. Earlier I told you that um, you should see the code being run as four instances of the same program running in parallel. And you could implement that with four POSIX threads. Like if you want to run a, a function four times in parallel, you could just spawn four threads, run the same function from the four threads, and that would work. Uh, the problem is that if you want to be able to communicate between these threads, so for example, maybe you have some computation that's only that's that's done once and then shared between uh, the threads. Um, if you want to do that kind of communication, it's gonna be really tedious. You have to put like mutexes and stuff and barriers and all sorts of weird stuff. Uh, but with SIMD, uh, you just you just don't need that. Like there's no like hardware threads that are running on different like different speeds. It's just lockstep SIMD. You don't need barriers. There's no weirdness. Uh, you can kind of just like communicate between these different instances of the program being run. And uh, the way that you can see it kind of is it's kind of like, it's kind of like synchronization at sequence points. So it's, one way you can see it is like, if it was multiple threads running, it'd be like a mutex to lock, like, or to synchronize them like in between every statement. And actually this corresponds pretty closely to what actual C++ works like today because of sequence points. So uh, moving on. Um, I want you to get a feel for SBMD to understand kind of like how it works and, and your mind uh, around like thinking in the SBMD kind of way. So we're gonna be looking at two case studies. The first one is ISPC, which is a CPU programming language uh, for SIMD. And we're also gonna be looking at uh, how shaders work on the AMD GCN GPU, which is uh, of course a GPU programming language. And uh, so you don't necessarily need to focus too much on the details of ISPC or AMD, but more I, I want you to just get familiar with the idea of SBMD. So case study, case study number one is the ISPC compiler. So uh, ISPC is a compiler for a CPU programming language uh, made by Matt Barr and some other people, I guess. Um, ISPC.github.io is where you can find it if you want to go check it out. Um, just going to do a quick overview here. It's basically a C-like language for SPMD and SIMD. In fact, it was originally based on a C compiler, so it's, it's very close. Um, another way you can see it, if you're a graphics programmer, this might make more sense for you. It's, it's like shaders for the CPU. Um, so it's actually, it's an Intel project, but it's actually open source. It supports uh, a wide variety of platforms because it basically just hooks into LLVM at the end of the day. So you got x86-64, you got ARM, you got Xeon Phi. It works on PS4, so that's all good. Um, now let's move on to an actual example of how to use ISPC. So I'm just gonna walk you through this code here and hopefully it's gonna be uh, insightful. So here's the signature for the function that I'm gonna demonstrate. Uh, this is a, a simple function. It's gonna do only a little bit of trivial work. Um, you can see a few new things here from a regular C program. Uh, first of all, you can see there's a uniform keyword that shows up. So the uniform keyword in ISPC means that the value is a scalar, which is like, uh, basically, if you come from C++, when you see uniform, basically, it's the same thing as if it was in C++. I mean, basically, if you want to translate this to C++, just take off the uniform keyword and it means the same thing. That's, that's how I see it anyways. Um, and then there's a new keyword also on the left here, export. And so what export does is just ISPC's way of, of uh, creating the, the foreign function interface. So this says that this function can be called from C and it, it works into its whole FFI system. Um, so this function is gonna loop over the array for inputs and do some computation and write the outputs. Um, so this is a, a for each loop in ISPC, which is again like a, a small departure from how C works, but uh, should be pretty easy to understand how it works. Um, basically just does a loop over the range zero to n. Uh, it's like a, it's like a, what is it, half upper bound. So it, it goes to n minus one. Um, and then that's how we're gonna write our loop that goes over this inputs. So the first thing it does is it loads the inputs for one uh, step of the computation. And again, we've got a new keyword here. So this new keyword here, varying, uh, is a very interesting one. Uh, what it means is that the value of this variable, v, is different depending on the program instance. So I was saying earlier that you should think about SPMD code as, or SMD code and SPMD code, you should see it as a bunch of different uh, instances with the same program running in parallel. And what the varying keyword here means, it means that in each of these instances, this variable has a different value, 
which is different from the uniform variables. The uniform variables have the same value in every program instance because they're scalar. So that's, uh, that's a distinction that's made between those two. And so uh, what's interesting here is like the index variable, for example, uh, the index variable in the first iteration of this loop uh, is actually the index itself is a varying variable. So the index in the first loop, if, if you're running on SSC2, the index might correspond to 0, 1, 2, 3. So it's actually corresponding to four values of the four first indices of the iteration. And when you index the array V in with this varying value, um, you're indexing with four indices. So that means you actually, you know, it, for example, with SSC2. So that actually loads four values. And that's why V has a varying value. It's because you're loading four values with different indices from the same array. So once you've loaded this, this variable from memory, uh, you can do some computation with it. So I'm just gonna show an if else again. Um, so it begins with an if, and uh, the, inter the interesting thing is that this if comparison, since V is varying, the result of the comparison has a different value depending on the program instance. And so the code inside the if block uh, should only appear as if it, it should only appear to have run inside the program instances where the test passed. And the way that's implemented is exactly how I showed you earlier with the masking and the blending and all that stuff. Then we got the else block, uh, same thing as earlier again, where it'll just like flip the mask and then run the else block and the assignment of like square root of V to V will only actually appear to have happened uh, in the instances of the program where the test uh, resulted in the else branch being run. Finally, at the end, uh, we write the outputs back to the V out array. And so uh, again, index <laughs> is a varying variable. So this write to memory actually corresponds to four writes to memory in parallel uh, by writing to the indices 0, 1, 2, 3 in the first uh, iteration of a loop, for example. So there's actually a, an interesting thing here. It was like, um, the way I explain this is I explain this in terms of like, uh, kind of like how the SIMD works for it. But uh, one thing you can do is actually this varying keyword, uh, if you just like, you know, if you just uh, entertain the idea that uh, just imagine it wasn't there. Just imagine it's not actually on the slide. Um, and if you imagine it's not there, uh, you'll notice that the, the code actually reads like a regular C program. You don't actually have to think about the fact that it's SIMD. It's just, if you read this and you imagine it's just like some weird C dialect, you would see a for each loop and you would see an index and it would do an if else and then write to memory and there would be like, there'd be nothing especially weird about this. Uh, and actually in ISPC, varying is the default qualifier. So if you leave it out, it'll still compile and do the same thing. And that's kind of like the idea of ISPC is that you can write programs that appear as if they're just a regular old C program. In reality, it's running in, is running back to rise code. And so you can kind of like shift between these two perspectives when you're writing code. Like either you're thinking about it as like, okay, it's just a C program and I'm just writing it like it's a C program. Or you can get like, you can kind of like switch your mind to the other mode where you're thinking like, okay, it's actually a vector here and a scalar here and blah, blah, blah. So uh, you can kind of like switch back and forth between these two modes of, of work. When you finish comp writing this program, you can compile it with the SPC compiler. So uh, you know, if, if it's called simple.ispc on your file system, you just compile it, and as a result, you'll get two files. You'll get a header, like a C header or C++ header that you can include from your C++ code to be able to call this function. And then it'll also give you an object file, like an object file that you can just link to your program, and that'll just work. So uh, actually pretty easy to integrate. All right, so moving on, we're gonna look at a second case study now. Uh, now we're gonna look at shaders on AMD GCN. And AMD, uh, so GCN, Maybe if you're a gamer, it might sound like GameCube, but it's not GameCube, it's Graphics Core Next. So Graphics Core Next is uh, AMD's current GPU architecture, and I'm gonna talk about it a little bit. So uh, it's not just a GPU architecture, actually, GCN. It's, it's also an instruction set architecture, in the sense that they have specified like an actual assembly language that you can use to program for it. Um, this, the, you know, this is kind of like part of a big push for GPGPU, so um, especially like if you're programming on game consoles right now, you probably have uh, done a lot of compute code tends to be that, uh, tends to be the, the fastest way to write code on consoles right now. Um, and, and namely, that's like probably one of the most important cases that at least in my, my like daily life, it's mostly important to know about AMD CN because it is a GPU used in current generation game consoles. So um, let's look at some basics because I wanna show you some assembly code and I wanna first make sure that we know what the notation means. So um, GCN has two sets of registers. It has a set of vector registers and a set of scalar registers. So the scalar registers, I'm gonna talk about in a little second, but uh, the vector registers are named R0, R1, and R2, and R3, and R4, and et cetera. And uh, each of these vector registers corresponds to, uh, you could say, a SIMD register with 64 values. It's actually very wide, 64. And um, you can actually operate on them in a pretty straightforward way. So for example, this instruction here, v add f32 just does 
64 additions in parallel. So it'll take R0 and R1, do these 64 parallel additions, and write the result to R2. And so you can, you can probably guess, like, the V underscore at the start means it's a vector operation, and F32 means it's a 32-bit floor operation. Should be not too surprising. Um, so there's, these, there's those vector registers, but there's also scalar registers. And so the scalar registers are named S0, uh, S0 S1, S2, and et cetera. And uh, you can use them for scalar operations. So for example, um, here in this case, I'm doing an AND, so just a bitwise AND uh, between S0 and S1. It's going to result in S2. And again, you can probably guess the prefix S underscore is for scalar and the B32 is to say that's a 32-bit operation. Um, moving on, there's a few special registers that you need to know about. Uh, first one is VCC, so the vector condition code. Um, this is when you do a comparison, like for example here, compare less than between R0 and R1. Uh, since those are vector registers, the comparison has more than one result, has 64 results, and they're encoded as a bit set, like 64 bits, where each bit corresponds to did it pass or did it fail. And so uh, when you do a comparison like that one, the output is stored in the VCC register. So that's how that works. And by the way, the VCC register, you can, maybe you notice the color coding, the purple letters I'm using here are for vectors, and the blue letters are for scalars. So VCC is actually a scalar register of 64 bits. Um, okay, moving on, there's the, another special register, the execution mask, uh, called exec. And so the execution mask is actually very similar to the mask that I showed you earlier in this talk when I was demonstrating how to convert C code to SIMD code. And uh, basically what it does is just uh, the value of the exec mask is used to mask out any operations that the GPU does. So whenever you do an operation with, with vectors, um, it, it will only affect the execution lanes that are set in the exec register. And you can actually just arbitrarily read and write to this. So for example here, uh, I'm doing an AND of the VCC and exec and storing that in exec. And that's a very common pattern you'll see because it's used to like mask uh, execution for like an if block, for example, if you've done a comparison and use that comparison as a, for, for an if. So moving on, let's look at how this is actually used uh, to compile a code. So on the left here, you can see a very simple uh, OpenGL shader program, or it could, be, it could be a DirectX shader program. Honestly, it's, it's simple enough that it could be BISCI, any language at this point. Uh, but for the sake of for the sake of discussion, let's assume it's a shader. Um, if we want to translate the shader into GCN assembly, uh, you would do it like this. So let's begin. Um, hopefully, you're not too small. Hopefully, you can all read it. Uh, we would begin by doing a comparison. So this says compare greater than between the two inputs. So it matches the first line of code in the in the function that just does a greater than comparison. Um, then the trick is so this is like an added dimension to what I showed you earlier. Um, in this shading language, it's possible that the calling function exec mask was not all on. Like in the example I showed you earlier, the execution mask was all on at the start, which was like a nice assumption. But in this case, uh, you can't assume that the exec register is, is all on when the function starts. So uh, what that means is like, if we're gonna be messing around with the exec register, you have to make sure that it goes back to what it needs to be uh, at the end of the function. And so uh, this function begins by storing uh, into a temporary variable the value of the execution mask, and that way it's gonna be able to restore it at the end. All right, um, then similar to how I showed you uh, in the last slide, uh, just do an AND of the execution mask with the VCC, and that'll make it so that only the lanes that pass the greater than comparison are gonna be active uh, from, from the ones that started off. All right, then, the, so there's kind of like a few things happening here. Um, if you direct your attention to the purple line of code here, you can see that's the multiplication that's happening inside the if block. Um, and then around it, I've got like a bit of like control flow logic. So uh, here you can see the label for the else block, which corresponds to, of course, the else part of the program here. And above it, I've got this branch. So um, what I'm doing here is actually, uh, it's doing a branch if the VCC is zero. And so what that means is like, if the comparisons all failed, that means that nobody is gonna be running the if block in the sense of like, if, if nobody, if, if, you, if you inputted like a, a, set of a, a set of values for A and B and the comparison resulted in no passes, like the, everything failed, that means that you don't even need to run the if block. You can just not run it. And that's what's happening here. So if everybody failed the test, it, it'll just branch directly to the else block and not run the if block. It's kind of like a little optimization um, that you'll see pretty commonly. So moving on, when we get to the else block, the first thing we do is we flip the mask, like I was talking about earlier. Uh, but there's like an added detail here again, which is that we have to take into consideration that the mask was not all on at the start. So this is just making sure that uh, you take into account the fact that the initial mask was not all on and, and, and that uh, to make sure that you respect the original constraints. All right, and then very similarly to before, 
we do a little branch trick to make it so that if none of the execution lanes are on, we just branch and skip the else block entirely. But if that didn't happen, then we do a sub, and that, that'll do the, the subtraction between uh, the two inputs. And uh, I should mention, just to be clear, that this multiplication and the subtraction that happened in this code, uh, they only affect the lanes that were set in the exact mask. Okay, so this is kind of like a little bit different because in the earlier example, I had to explicitly do like a blend instruction. Uh, but in this case, uh, it's actually just done implicitly. So it's just everything's masked always. And all right, so that's the end of the function. So just bring back the execution mask to what it was at the start. And we've all cleaned up our slate and it all works. So that's all I want to say for GCN assembly. All right, in summary, what did we learn from these uh, case studies? So first of all, we've seen that we can use SPMD to map C languages to SIMD. Uh, the code that we can write is, is high level, so we can use it to write like loops and conditionals in ways that let us write like uh, better algorithms more easily rather than focusing on little assembly finicky details. And uh, the nice thing is like once you understand how the C code maps to intrinsics or assembly, um, you can still kind of like look at the code and understand what the performance is going to be like because you know how the implementation details work basically in the sense that you know that, oh there's going to be some masking here and there's going to be some jumps here to like you know make sure that whatever uh, just to say like it's possible to understand what's actually happening behind the hood and that's like an important characteristic of C like languages because uh, of course we wouldn't be writing C if we didn't have a performance so um, another cool thing is that I showed you that it runs both on CPU and GPU so shows that this paradigm actually has quite a bit of versatility. And uh, I've shown you also that these languages exist today, in the sense that like today you can write high performance CPU or GPU code using SPMD-like languages. Uh, but you can't really do this in C++. So um, how can we do this in C++, which is the next question I'm gonna answer uh, for the rest of this talk, basically. And so the way that I've suggested to implement this in C++ so far is uh, what I call CPP SPMD, which is way to write SPMD code in C++. Um, so what is SPMD, or CPP SPMD? CPP SPMD is a little header-only library I've made. Um, it's a subset of ISPC in plain C++. So basically, I, I just look at like the ISPC spec, and I, I just go like, oh, I like this function, I like this function, and I just like put them in. So it's basically like a total ripoff, but it, it works. So um, it's implemented with intrinsics, like the actual header itself contains intrinsics and stuff. Uh, but when you write the code, you don't have to care about what specific instruction set you're writing for, really. And that's actually that's the same thing with ISPC, for example. Um, and if you want to get like the executive summary of how it's actually implemented, it's basically just uh, control flow is represented by lambdas, and these lambdas are executed uh, with masks. That's like the one sentence summary of how this library works. And I'll go in more detail uh, in the next slides. And I should mention this library is just like a proof of concept. So I've only implemented uh, what I needed for my tests, and I, it's not ready for production. Although I've had a lot of people who are interested in it, so maybe we can actually uh, like take it a bit more seriously and turn it to something that's actually useful. Um, all right, so I'm just going to show you quickly how to translate ISPC types to CPP SPMD types. So earlier we were talking about uniform int and uniform float, and I told you that when you see a uniform int or uniform float, it's basically the same thing as if it was just one int or one float, just like a regular C uh, scalar. And so that's actually pretty convenient because if you want to present these types in C++, it's actually just a regular int or float. There's, there's nothing quite special about that. Um, but what about varying it and varying float? These are kind of like new and, and exotic in C++ land. So uh, the way that I translate that is I created my own types, uh, v int and v float, which represent a varying int or varying float. So these are types that are given by CPP SPMD. Moving on, I'll show you a quick example of how to do control flow. So you can get a, probably a feel for what this is going to look like. Uh, uh, for CPP SPMD code. Um, you can see I've added like my own versions for control flow. So here instead of if, I say SPMD if. And uh, for example here, when I do v less than three, the value of v is a varying float. So the comparison less than three uh, actually is a, like it returns like a varying bool. And uh, based on the results of this varying bool, the function or the code that's, that's inside this lambda here is gonna be run with a mask that's, that takes that uh, if test into consideration. So to give you an idea of uh, how this actually uh, works, um, I'm just gonna kinda like quickly go over, uh, not, it's like a simplified version of the SPMD if implementation, it's like a bit more complicated if you actually go look at it, but I think I'll, I'll give you like a, a big idea of how this is supposed to work. Um, 
it's basically very similar to what we've seen before, but now written in C. So same as always, uh, save the execution mask into a temporary variable. Uh, then I'll do an AND to apply the, the if test so that now the execution mask only has its lane active where the if test passed. Um, then I'll just throw in the all off optimization. So if the execution mask is all off, just don't run the if block at all. It's just a cute little optimization. And uh, otherwise, just run the if body. So just passing a lambda there. And uh, finally, at the end of the day, just restore the execution mask. So it's, it's basically like, that's like, again, that's a simplified version. It's a, a little bit more complicated in practice, but uh, that's basically the, the principle. And that, that's it's pretty much, uh, at the end of the day, that's, it's pretty much as simple as it gets. So, um, all right, so now to implement the varying variables like v here, which is like a v float, I'm just gonna quickly show you the, again, simplified version of how this is implemented. So the v float and v int classes are basically just wrappers for uh, M M128 types or M256 256 types, whatever is the intrinsic uh, implementation detail data type. Um, the mathematical operations like the times operation are just implemented with operator overloads. And so here, if you do operator times on two v floats, it just does a mul ps, like a multiplication of two packed single precision floats. And one thing you might notice is that um, in this multiplication here, I'm not taking the mask into consideration, which is a little bit weird, uh, but actually it works because uh, the trick is that it doesn't really matter if you multiply things together that are, are masked out. It's like, yeah, it'll do some multiplications that are gonna be thrown away, so it's not the best thing, but um, it doesn't actually matter that you have these, these like unnecessary values because um, if it, the, the fact that they're, they're necessary is gonna be reflected only when you actually do like a load or a store. So um, actually like, that's kind of like, I'm kind of hitting towards it. The, the store and the load are things that take the execution mask into account. So um, this is actually partly why, if you have some foresight, um, you'll see that this is actually why I have to put store into a function uh, so I can access the execution mask from, from this function. Um, and so when you do a store, it'll take the execution mask into account and only blend values then. Uh, so that's basically how the masking is actually implemented. And uh, yeah, so let's look at a sample program of how this works. So there's gonna be some ugliness, but I promise it's all for a good reason, at least so far. Uh, so when you wanna write an SPMD program or an SPMD function with this framework, uh, you have to write, uh, you have to actually wrap it into a struct. So instead of a function, it's a struct. So this is like declaring a function called simple, but instead you make it a struct. And you have to inherit from SPMD kernel. Now, uh, the body of the function, it can, have, it can have any return type you want, and it can take any arguments you want, uh, but the convention is just that uh, it has to be called underscore call. And again, I promise there's a good reason for this. Uh, well, a good reason for now. So this is gonna be very similar to this simple program that I showed earlier with ISPC. So we're gonna do a for each loop, and you can see I've implemented my own SPMD for each, pass in the, the upper bound and lower bound, and it'll just loop through that. And uh, at every iteration, it'll call the lambda that corresponds to one iteration of this for each loop. And uh, so you can see we've got the index variable, it's back. Uh, but now it's actually, there's a new type that I haven't introduced to you yet. Here it's lint. So lint is a linear int. And what a linear int means is it's actually a, a special case of varying. So when you have a varying variable in the gen most general case, a varying variable has a completely different value in every execution lane. Uh, but when you have a linear value, it means that the value is increasing by one with every lane, which is actually very important because it means that instead of doing a gather operation, you can do a load instruction, which is maybe like, maybe this is gibberish to you, uh, but it's to say that if you, if you load from memory with contiguous indices, it can be a very simple load that just like reads out those values. If you do a load from memory with different indices, like completely random indices, there's still instructions to do that, but it's much slower than doing a regular old plain load. Uh, although the gap is closing, it's getting better with our architecture. So, um, very similar to before, uh, load the inputs into a vfloat this time. Um, and then here's the if else, so a bit gnarly because of the lambda notation, but hopefully not too unreadable. Uh, where you can see I've got the if test at the start, the v less than three, and then I pass in the if block and the else block as lambdas. And so the idea is that this SPMD if else uh, statement is gonna do the comparison, and then it's gonna run the if block and the else block with the appropriate mask set in between the calls. Okay. And uh, finally, store the results back to memory. So you can see there's the explicit load and store function names, which is something I'll talk about later. But um, other than that, hopefully uh, not too unreasonable. Um, if you actually wanna call this, this, this function, this program, 
Um, you could do it like this. So let's just suppose you've got some input array and some output array that you've set up. Um, here's what, kind of like what the main would look like. So you use this SPMD call function, and instead of passing in like, okay, so you, you pass in like the, the, the function name you want to call, or I guess the kernel name you want to call as a template argument, and then you just pass in the arguments of the function as if it was just a regular function call, and that's going to invoke the kernel. And in this case, uh, since you're calling this, this kernel from outside of the kernel, it's going to start off unmasked. Like this, the mask is going to be fully, or fully on, I guess. So um, this is like, no, maybe at first it, it's kind of like, is it really going to work? Because you know we've got lambdas everywhere. We've got this like vfloat type. We've got like these magical stores and floats and stuff. So um, like, is this going to hurt performance? That's a big question because all this is an optimization if you think about it. Um, so I did some performance tests. So what I did basically is I took the sample programs from the ISPC examples folder, and I the examples folder in ISPC contains an implementation in C++ and it contains an implementation in ISPC. And so I took those programs and I ported them and I created a, a CBP SPMD version of those programs. And I used that to compare the performance. So um, starting off with the plain C++ code, uh, I ran this noise function code uh, 100 times, I think. And that took 45.5 seconds, which is actually a pretty long time. Um, porting it directly to CBP SPMD uh, lowered the runtime down to 10 seconds, which is like a four times speed up right off the bat, which is actually pretty good. Uh, but then, I ran the ISPC version of the program, and it did a lot better. So it's like almost you know, around twice as fast. Uh, so that's kind of a disappointment. Uh, but you know, I thought, hey, this is C++. We should be able to make things fast. How, how could ISPC beat us? So I did some investigation, found out that actually it seems like uh, C++ compilers just like, aren't optimizing aggressively enough at some stuff, especially gathers. Like ISPC is way better at finding like redundant gathers and pulling them out of the loop. It, just to say, like the optimization, it's like much more aware of like what's fast and what's slow in terms of architecture. It seems. Um, so I, I found what optimizations ISPC was doing, and basically just redid it by hand, and then went around and did a few other things, uh, just like tweaks and stuff, and then ended up getting, hey, it's a little bit faster than ISPC with a, you know, a bit of work. And I found actually like running it with profile get optimization made it even faster. So you know, getting up to nine x performance, that actually feels pretty good because. Uh, this is running on AVX2 on the AVX2 instruction set, and the AVX2 instruction set lets you run vectors of width eight. So it's kind of like super linear speed up, which is kind of like, what? But hey, it works, I guess. Um, and also, uh, on Monday, Bernie Strushup said that he wanted like 10 times improvements to C++. And I was looking at the slide yesterday, and I was like, oh no, it's like, it's like 9x, it's like not high enough. But then I noticed, like, actually, I ran this program on my laptop here, which is a newer architecture than, than the one at the, at the top of the slide there. And actually, with the improvements in the architecture, hey, it's actually relative to the first one, relative to the older architecture running plain C++ code, it's actually 11 times faster. So I think this is proof that um, if you want like a even more than 10 times improvement in C++ code, uh, we can actually accomplish that with a combination of using SIMD and you know embracing new architectures. Uh, so hey, it's, it's promising. Um, I've got some other examples. So, for example, here's the Mandelbot set. Again, like you can't write a talk about parallelism with SIMD without having a Mandelbot set, apparently. Um, so, at first, with just like regular C++ code doing a thousand runs, it took almost 100 seconds. This is actually like almost painfully long to wait for. Um, I ported it straight to CPP SPMD and went down to like two times or you know 53 seconds. Uh, not bad, but still pretty slow compared to everything else. Notice like ICC, the Intel compiler does a bit better job, so down to 30 seconds. That's nice. Um, and basically, just like these differences between compilers that are so huge, I think it just makes me see that uh, we need to make like compiler vendors aware of like how to optimize code for this. Basically, um, that's what it, that's what it means to me. Um, moving on, though, it's it's again like ISPC still managed to get like a, a huge speed up from this CPSPMD code, going down to 16 seconds. And again, in this case, I was like, come on, this is C++. We should be able to do better. So I went in and like. Figured out where the, where the bottlenecks were and did a bunch of optimization stuff and, and realized, like, okay, so this, this way to actually speed it up. And, and then it got down to 15 seconds with, with some work, right? So, again, like, kind of like similar to the first one, um, it was slower than ISPC at first, but with some hand optimizations, you can, you can get it back to, to where it's supposed to be. Um, I've got a few more examples. So, this one is a volume rendering example where it takes a point cloud and renders it as a nice looking stream of, I don't know, smoke. Um, I didn't have time to actually like hand optimize this one, so. I, I kind of like just admitted defeat. Um, still though, the C++ code, like the regular old C++ code is, is pretty slow and just porting it to CUP SPMD got a huge speed up um, on both Visual C++ and Intel compiler. 
Um, running on SPC still is the champion, but um, the gap is not so far compared to the Intel compiled example. All right, and since uh, finance is so important in C++, uh, I've supported some of the, uh, I guess, like finance algorithms. Like I don't really, I'm not familiar with them, but I, I, I think these are used for like stock, buying stocks or something like that. I don't really know. Uh, anyways, uh, I ported this code without even knowing what it does. And uh, so, the, you know, you can still see an improvement from plain C++. So um, running the CPPSP version of binomial options got me a small speed up and ISPC is still a little bit faster. Um, actually, it's kind of surprising that the binomial options is like, it's really not getting that much use out of SIMD and I haven't investigated why, but that's like an interesting case out of all the examples that it seems to not scale that well. And uh, then there's a black holes algorithm. Um, that one got a lot faster with CPSPMD with a straight port uh, from like, just getting a four times speed up like that. Uh, running with uh, Intel got a little bit faster, uh, but again, here ISPC was a champion and I didn't have time to make a, a hand optimized version. So to summarize all these examples, here's some, a nice graph. So uh, the plain C++ is the blue bar and the orange bar is CPSPMD's performance relative to the, the, the blue ones. Uh, ISPC is the gray bar, and then uh, when I took the time to optimize it, uh, that's the yellow bar. So um, I can show you, should give you like a big idea of, of what's going on here. It seems like um, if you want like the you know really great results and like not have to do any like tricky optimizations and all that kind of stuff, you can just use ISPC today, and that seems like uh, probably the best choice. Um, but if you really want C++ code um, and you're willing to maybe profile your code and maybe like I don't know. Uh, deal with the fact that current compilers are maybe not as good at optimizing vector code, um, CPPSPMD might be an option. So that's the performance of it. Um, but the code earlier still like had a lot of ugly parts. And so uh, what I want to talk about now is just like all the quirks of how this works. And uh, part of the idea of these quirks is that um, it's going to be also like a, a way to suggest improvements to the C++ language. So, one of the first quirks is the fact that you have to actually explicitly load and store. And the reason why is because um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to make it so that when you do an assignment to a vfloat with the operator assignment, um, I'd like it to do a, like a mask store. Um, but actually that's not possible and because I need the execution mask in that assignment operator and that assignment operator has to be a member function of vfloat, which doesn't have access to the execution mask. And the same thing happens for like my, my vfloat ref class. So vfloat, vfloat ref is supposed to be like it's the result of an indexing operation. And so uh, when you convert that to a, a vfloat, it gives you like the result of, of loading from that address. And uh, again, this, this conversion operator has to be a member function, so I can't access the execution mask in that member function. Um, so you know, that, that's why I can't use it. Maybe it's a zero plus defect, because I don't see why this isn't really possible. Like maybe it's just like we don't have the syntax for it or something. Um, what I wish I could just write is just like have my vflow class and then read the assignment operator in the body of SVMD kernel. And in that case, uh, I cannot have access to the execution mask. And like, I mean, like I already have this code. It's just that it's called like load and store instead of being called operator assignment. So other than like syntactical issues, I don't see why this isn't possible. Um, but so yeah, maybe that's an improvement that's possible. Another thing you might have noticed if you, if you look carefully is that when I index arrays, I say index a pointer instead of pointer of index, which is like a, a bit uh, weird. So the reason why is because you can't overload the operator to index a, a float pointer. Because I guess you just can't overload operators from built-in classes like that, uh, as far as I can tell. So I kind of like abuse this, this identity here, which by the way, this works in all C programs. Um, just the fact that like when you do pointer of i, it's the same thing as doing star pointer plus i, which is the same thing as doing i plus pointer, if you referenced, which is the same thing as doing i of pointer. Like this actually works in, in all C programs. And so, um, by using that identity, I just overloaded uh, the operator for vint. So you say vint, like, quote, no, braces, flow pointer. And basically, when you translate code, you just have to switch the order of the, like, the, the arguments to the, to the braces operator, uh, or the, the square braces operator. And other than that, it, it kind of just works. So kind of like a, a dirty trick. And it basically just syntax. But maybe there's a way to fix this by uh, adding new, like, ways for overlaying operators in C++. Um, another quirk is the need to call SPMD call. Like, it'd be nice if you could just call it as if it was a regular function, like as if it just worked like a regular function, but instead you have to use a SPMD call. And the reason why is because uh, when you call a function, like a SPMD function from another function, um, you have to actually do an implicit, like pass by value of the execution mask. 
And uh, so um, right now that's not possible. Like, you know, it's kind of weird because it is possible to implicitly pass like the this pointer. Like the this pointer is something that's implicitly passed between member functions. Uh, but the execution mask, uh, like you can't do that right now. So I don't know, maybe there's a way to fix that. Um, and other than that, uh, thank you. Uh, other than that, this is basically how it works. So it's like if you call it from the outside of an SPMD kernel, I'll just call the function with a mask that's all on. And if you call SPMD call from inside an SPMD kernel, then it'll, like the only thing, like the body for SPMD call is actually extremely small. All it does is it copies the mask and then calls the function. That's all it does. And so that also explains maybe why, uh, that maybe also explains why it's called underscore call. The reason I, I made it so you have to call it underscore call is because um, it's just to give you a hint that like you're not supposed to touch this basically. Like if you have to explicitly say dot underscore call, like you know you're doing something wrong. So uh, I just read. Hmm? Is it really? I don't think so. No. No. Yeah. Yeah. So we're all, we're all good. <laughs> yeah. Two underscores, yeah. Yeah. I was on the same question, I also took away one underscore. Is it because of the So, yeah, that's why I call it like that. And uh, oh, it's, it's kind of ugly, but it works for now. Um, another quirk is that there's these lambdas everywhere. And, uh, like, these lambdas, like, it's not like you can do much with it. Like, this is basically just noise. It doesn't actually add anything, like, in terms of functionality that you can have, like, these lambdas with, with that, take, that capture everything and just do whatever. Um, so, from what I saw, it seemed like they usually get inlined. So, it's not really, like, a performance problem. Like, you don't actually get translated into function calls most of the time. Uh, but just ugly syntax. So, I don't know if there's actually a good way to fix this other than actually changing the CLSS grammar. Um, so maybe in the future there's going to be like an actual extension to the grammar that lets you do something like this more easily, I hope. Um, maybe there's a way to do it with macros. I haven't really thought about it too hard because I just dislike macros and I feel like that's defining the purpose. Uh, but maybe there's a way to do it if somebody, if somebody knows like a clean way to do that. Um, all right, next thing is the fact that you have to inherit from SPMD kernel. So it's like, why do you have to inherit from SPMD kernel? The reason why is because it gives you the execution mask and also gives you the related logic for the execution mask. So that's, that's basically why you have to inherit from that. And uh, I kind of see it like, it's not necessarily a bad thing because actually it could be used to configure the, the implementation of the SIMD. So for example, uh, what I mean by that is, imagine you want to write a kernel that you know you want it to use AVX2. This is just like, in theory. Um, maybe there could be like an SPMD kernel AVX2 and then that way uh, you're guaranteed what the instruction set is being used for your, for your kernel. Alternatively, maybe it could be something like this, where like you get a template argument for the width, and that could be useful because uh, when you're writing code that interfaces between like SIMD code, like this this code and another code, sometimes you want you want to assume that just like you're working in blocks blocks of 16, like maybe you're working in blocks of 16 pixels or something like that, and uh, the fact that you're using an instruction set that works in terms of four or in terms of eight or in terms of 16 is kind of like an impl implementation detail. So being able to say that like uh, being able to say that this kernel should run with with an emulated width of 16 is something that could be pretty convenient. And so basically just to, to give you an idea, like if you're running like a, a SPMD kernel that is supposed to pretend to be 16 wide, but the instruction set you're using only has four wide vectors, it basically means that every operation is quadrupled. Like just every statement just happens four times. That, that's what it means. Uh, and other than that, I think that that's pretty much it. So uh, that. Yeah, so I don't know. I think I might have explored that, but the, the problem is just when you do the SPMD call, you have to be able to set the mask and all that kind of stuff, so. And within this line, it's fine, just they are not compatible to the mm. running and yeah. the there. Yeah, it'd be nice to do like, I don't know, I, I kind of got it working, but there's a lot of things that could be improved by people who, who know better, like so the detailed rules of C++. So is that really open source? Uh, yeah, I'm actually gonna talk about that in a second. Okay. Yeah. So in conclusion, uh, we've seen today that SPMD is like a actually pretty uh, like widespread uh, portable uh, way to write code that seems to be you know it works on both CPUs and GPUs so um, it's actually pretty nice. Um, I've shown you that you can actually implement it in relatively simple C++ code. So like I didn't write any like weird template metaprogramming stuff. There was no macros involved. It was just like uh, like the SPMD kernel class that just like has a few like functions in it 
and it runs lambdas. So it's nothing like too spooky. I think anybody can understand it really. Um, based on the performance measurements that I did, it seems like today if you want to write code that looks like this, uh, the best bet is to use ISPC. Uh, but hey, maybe tomorrow C++ is going to be the best choice. So hopefully we can work towards something like that. Um, Maybe we're missing like language support in terms of like new syntaxes for things, uh, like I showed earlier. Uh, maybe we also need to have compilers be more aware of how to optimize code for SIMD architectures, uh, which is a thing that maybe maybe explains like the big differences in performance between different compilers. Um, but hey, we've got the right people uh, in the room at the conference, so you know let's think about how we can close this gap. Um, other than that, thank you for listening. Um, if you have any questions or comments, let's talk about it. Um, you can find the implementation here. Again, it's not production ready. Uh, it's just like it only implements what I needed for the performance measurements that I did before, basically. And uh, if you want to talk on Twitter, here's my Twitter. Other than that, that's all. Thank you. Yeah? Could you say a little more about why your assignment operator couldn't get access to the map? I'm kind of trying to figure out the structure of the code. That right. So, um, so as far as I know, when you write an assignment operator, Okay, so I'll read the question. The question is, why can't I access the execution mask from inside the assignment operator? Uh, the reason why is because, as far as I could tell, uh, the assignment operator has to be a member function of the class that it's assigning to. And so it has to be a member function of vfloat. And vfloat is a separate type from SPMD kernel. And so it has to be able to access the execution mask that, that's stored in the SPMD kernel that, that contains it. And uh, in this case, uh, I don't think there's a way to do that in C++. And like, yeah, maybe I could do something like, maybe I could store the pointer to the SPMD kernel from inside the vfloat, but I just said that seems like two overhead. So, yeah. So the, the kernel is where? The kernel, is it an object? Yeah, the kernel is a, an object, and uh, all it really does is give you the execution mask, and, uh, and it gives you the functions that are necessary to write SPMD code. Like, you just inherit those functionalities. So, so why can you not access the tree from a member function down in the Okay, actually, vfloat is defined like in the scope of SVMD kernel. Like it's like a inner class. Oh, it's an inner yeah. class. Yeah. Um, but, but I think that doesn't really change anything about yeah, how they can access each other. More. Yeah. So, more than get that into a separate so you can look at the code. Uh, okay. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's move on. Yeah. yeah. Right. right. The back? Right. So I'm going to repeat, I'm going to try to summarize this comment. I think what you're suggesting is that we could implement this by returning kind of like a lazily evaluated like masking operation. That'd be very cool. I'd like to see that. Thank you. Uh, yes? You mentioned something pretty interesting about uh, trying to run against widths that does not make it with a hard map. Mm -hmm. So does that not open the door to the same kind of thing that you get with the shader map? Right. So the question is. Uh, because if you oh. extend beyond the naked width, you can't necessarily rely on lots that being present unless you ensure that your, uh, the badges are strongly ordered. Because you might do four, and then you might, the execution might get three ordered. Do you see what I'm saying? In the same sense in which if you have uh, a GPU that's run in 32 elements per batch, and you actually programmatically set your batch to be one to eight, and you attack some sort of shared state. You, in order to guarantee ordering, you need to insert the barriers. Wouldn't well, this be an issue here as well? So the, the question, I'll try to summarize, or the comment, I guess, is uh, if you try to extend the native SIMD width by duplicating every operation, um, does that not lead to the case where you actually do need to put a barrier? And um, I think it doesn't. My main, like inherently, the reason why I think it doesn't is because ISPC lets you do it. In the sense that ISPC lets you say, like, uh, run this AVX code as if it was 16 wide, and that works. 
So I assume like the model doesn't prevent it. It should, in theory, work. I haven't got a proof of concept in CPSPMD, so maybe there's some other details I'm not thinking of, uh, but I think it works. Um, and I think the important part to keep in mind is that uh, the synchronization happens at sequence points. So what that means is like uh, in one statement, which will be executed multiple times if you're doing like a wider width, um, like or at least it'll be executed once, but it'll be executed and it'll do multiple vector operations. Um, you can't assume that like, you can't communicate between lanes of execution, I guess like, yeah, you, you well, I don't know, how can I say it? You, you can't communicate you can't communicate using shared memory between lanes of execution inside one statement. You can only do it in between statements. And I think that that makes it work out. So, I mean, it's kind of like mind bending, so maybe we can think about it a bit longer, but I think it should work. And I think that the reason why, well, what is it? I think the reason why barriers are necessary on a GPU, for example, is because you actually do have multiple threads of execution in the sense that, like, by, by the word thread, I mean it's actually different pieces of hardware running the same code in parallel or without being in lockstep. So since these different executions are not in lockstep, you have to put a barrier. But in this case, it's in lockstep, so it's a bit simpler. So, right, so, right, so to repeat that, uh, on a GPU, um, how can I say, um, this doesn't scale to GPUs because um, GPUs, I guess you're saying, needs to be wider and needs to be running in multiple threads, like actual different hardware threads, and this model doesn't consider that, I guess. And I think, I think you're right about that, and uh, I think that, that uh, that problem might be on GPU vendors in GPU vendors' hands, that they have to make a more flexible computation model. That, that's my opinion. Uh, but yeah. But basically, like, I mean, the way that it works in a GPU is like, they'll have these different, like, they'll have these independent streams of like, wave fronts of like 64, 64 wide vector operations, but they're all getting scheduled independently. And um, I don't think we have a good way of, of like, controlling that from our code in a way that would make sense with C right now, but maybe in the future. Right, but locks that would kill the performance. So all this stuff would work just fine, as long as it doesn't appear on major screen design. As long as you're inside of one rate front, mm -hmm. yeah. And actually, I think that's a that's a thing that's getting more and more more and more popular. I think uh, like Shader Model Six, I think it is like the the new Shader Model exposes wave level operations. So yeah. that kind of stuff is something that I guess we'll be seeing more and more. All right, any more questions, comments? Uh, the license, I think it, uh, maybe it's MIT or something, I, I don't remember. Uh, it should be not a problem, yeah. If it's a problem, tell me and I can do anything necessary to make it possible to fix, yeah. Anybody else? Okay, I think we're just about done, so thank you for listening.